It's 2018 and a few things have changed, so let's do a shop tour. Before we get started on the shop tour, let me go ahead and talk about the space that I work out of. It is a two car garage that's 22 by 21. Um, and when I built this house seven years ago, I had no idea that I was even going to be getting into woodworking. It was nowhere on my radar. But luckily I had them insulate the outside wall, the attic, and the garage door. So luckily it stays fairly warm in here in the winter and it's sort of cool in the summer. Now for the heating and cooling, I have a Mitsubishi ductless mini split that I use. And for on the AC mode, uh, it does a really good job. It'll cool down this area uh, in probably about 45 minutes to an hour. Now for the lighting in the shop, I have six four bulb T8 fixtures that are four foot long. And I currently have uh, 4,100 Kelvin bulbs in it, but I plan on upgrading these to uh, 5,000, or not upgrading, but switching out the bulbs, 5,000 or 5,500 Kelvin. I'm not quite sure yet what I'm gonna go with, but I believe the 4,100 are a little too yellow for my taste. So I'm probably gonna go with 5,000 or 5,500 Kelvin and just switch all of these out. Let's start here at the lumber rack because this is where every project starts. I go to my local sawmill get the lumber that I need, come back and then stick it in the lumber rack for a couple of weeks before I use it just to let it acclimate to my shop. Now as you can see I've opted to go with a vertical lumber rack uh, for, for my purposes because I can fit 250 to 300 board feet in this little four foot section. The base is 17 inches wide and four feet long uh, so I can fit quite a few boards in this little area versus having to have uh, nine feet of horizontal space uh, on the wall. Now one trade-off with going with a vertical lumber rack like this is you will lose four feet of floor space. So in this area I can't put anything on the floor or the wall versus if you had a horizontal lumber rack it would typically be up off the wall or up on the wall off of the floor uh, several feet so you could put something underneath that. But I can fit 250 to 300 board feet in this small area right here. And another reason I went with this is it's easy to pick and choose the board that you want. You can look at the grain of all the boards by just undoing this little rubber strap, pulling out the board that you need, looking at the grain, sticking it back in there. There's no need to get up on a step ladder to shift stuff around and to move boards off of other boards to look at it. Now for the type of lumber that I keep in the lumber rack, I have cherry, mahogany, oak, maple, walnut, and a few different exotics that I've picked up over the years. For sheet goods and exceptionally wide lumber like this 21 inch wide bobinga that I have, uh, I keep behind the dust collector over here. I just slide it out of the way, push the sheets back there, and then slide it back. So fortunately, this gives me enough area to hold probably up to, I don't know, 10 sheets of plywood, but I very rarely use plywood uh, to where I need that many sheets. But again, I, I can also keep exceptionally wide lumber like this bobinga back here. So now we're going to talk about the workbench. It's to the left of the lumber rack and probably four feet away from the wall. It's made entirely out of poplar. The top is three inches thick and the legs are three inches square. Now when I built this uh, workbench, I used it as an outfeed and assembly table uh, probably four years ago when I had a different setup in my shop. Uh, so that's why you're going to notice that it is 27 inches wide, which is typically a little bit wider than you would want for a workbench. And plus, it's about 37 inches tall, which is probably 3 to 4 inches taller than you'd want a workbench. Um, so uh, if I were to build another workbench, which I probably will in a year or two, uh, I'm going to change the dimensions just a little bit. Now the workbench just has one vise, and it's this end vise, and it spans the full width of the workbench. The workbench has 12 dog holes, but unfortunately they're not through dog holes. Uh, so what I'm using are these Lee Valley Prairie Dogs. They're spring loaded, so I can push it, it comes up, and then push it again, and they're hidden and they're below or flush with the surface. And these little Prairie Dogs are pretty cool. They're adjustable, they got a little threaded plastic piece so you can make it taller or shorter depending on how deep your dog holes are. One cool feature about the workbench is it has four really deep drawers to allow me to store my hand tools. So on the first drawer, I've got my squares, a crap load of pencils, my chisels, really awesome uh, brass mallet from Dima's Woodshop, uh, calipers and some other stuff in the back. So the second drawer, uh, disregard tools laying on top of other tools, I'm going to be fixing that. but. 
this is what it looks like. I uh, figured I wouldn't you know, make it look pretty for the camera, show you exactly what it looks like. But these are my uh, spoke shaves, saws, rasps, all kinds of stuff, uh, burnisher. Uh, this is where I keep that stuff. The third drawer, again, is just miscellaneous stuff, mallets, um, plain that I don't use, and a project that I started a very long time ago was a high boy, and I turned all the legs, and maybe one day I'll get back to it. For now, that's where all the legs are um, in here. And finally, this is the fourth drawer, and as you can see, I really don't use it. Um, this is just miscellaneous stuff that I need to do something with. And what you're going to see along in this whole shop tour is I've got some miscellaneous junk that I need to get rid of. And I think I can uh, consolidate drawers and get rid of some stuff, some cabinets and, and whatnot to make more space in here. But this is an example of that. Now the dust collection in my shop is just this two horsepower Grizzly dust collector. Uh, it's 1700 CFMs and it's the model G0548ZP. Uh, it's got a one micron filter on top, and um, you know, it does everything that I need. It's plenty of uh, power, plenty of suction um, with my setup because I'm only running one tool at a time. I keep all of the blast gates closed except for the tool that I'm using. Uh, so it's, it, it does a, a good enough job for, for what I need. The only problem that I've had with this unit is the little flapper on the inside. Uh, it broke off, so that meant that I had to, you know, take this off and replace the flapper, uh, but that wasn't a big deal. It's just from wear and tear from me using it over probably the last three to four years. But other than that, no, uh, no other issues uh, with the motor or with the dust collector. Uh, it just does its job. Coming off of the dust collector, I've got a six inch hose that connects to a six inch main line. And it stays six inches until right at the tool where I go down to a four inch where I have the blast gate. So this first one you see is a four inch blast gate uh, that connects to the drum sander and it goes up on the arm and then down just to keep the hose out of the way on the drum sander. So coming down the line, this is where we go vertical over to the table saw and I've got a blast gate close to the main trunk so that way I can easily close that off and keep as much suction as possible on the main line. And then coming down here, it splits off to a four inch uh, pipe for the blast gate for the joiner planer combo. So the main six inch line drops down into three four inch ports, but this far right one I keep capped off because I don't have another tool over here. But this one goes to the uh, over the blade dust collection and this one goes down to the cabinet for the, uh, the cabinet saws dust collection. And finally, the pipe keeps coming down, splits off on this Y uh, to two four inch blast gates. One goes over to the router table and the other one stays here to where the bandsaw is. For the drum sander, I have a Performax 1632 and that means that I can sand up to a 32 inch wide board. Uh, I would run half of it, rotate it, and then run the other half since this is an open-ended drum sander. Now, for the paper that I keep on here, I normally keep 120 grit paper on the drum uh, unless I'm doing some slabs or something like that where I need uh, to remove a little bit more of the surface. I'll switch down to an 80 grit, uh, but majority of the time I, I keep 120 grit on the sander. Now, the joiner planer in my shop is this 12 inch combo machine. Uh, going with the combination machine allows me to have really wide jointing capacity of 12 inches plus having this tool will be all in one to save on floor space. So what I went with is the Jet JJP12, and this is a straight knife version, but I plan on switching the head out for the helical head sometime later this summer. Now this machine has worked great once you dial it in, and dialing it in is a task, and, and I can't emphasize that enough. It took me half a day to dial in this machine um, because you got four screws on each side of the bed. There's a lot of lifting and lowering, this, this bed, checking to make sure it's coplanar, uh, and once you have it, tighten up the bolts and you're good to go. But that, I mean, it's a task um, to do. But, you know, I've got everything dialed in, there's no snipe, it works great. I've been asked several times, how long does this take to switch over from the joiner to the planer, and is it a pain in the butt? And I wanted to show you that in real time, just so you get an idea of how long it takes. The first thing is you gotta unlock it, flip it up, and now this is locked into place. And now I'm going to undo the dust collection hose, flip this up, 
it's locked into place and then I bring the hose around. I've got a zip tie on this side to hold the, the hose and what that does is it holds it out of the way of the bed. But then I slide the hose on and now the hose is connected. And finally, engage the rollers for the planer and then bring the planer bed up to the thickness of your lumber. This is probably the most tedious part of this process, but it's not too bad. And then with it in its place, lock it so the bed doesn't move, run the board, unlock it, bring it up, run it, and just keep going until you get to your final thickness. Now, to put this back in the joiner mode, you do have to bring it back down to six inches before you can flip the dust collection shroud back over. And you're just reversing the operation. To the left of my combination machine, I have my wall hanging tool cabinet. And uh, this was inspired by a uh, Guy Dunlap from Guy's Woodshop. He did a build series over on simplecoveguild.com um, showing how to make a uh, chisel cabinet. Well, I took his plans and adjusted them just a little bit in order to make a wall hanging uh, tool cabinet. My bandsaw is a Porter Cable bandsaw that I picked up at Lowe's. Uh, it's a one and three quarter horsepower bandsaw. Uh, and originally it had a six inch cutting capacity, but I've since added a six inch riser block on the side. And I've also added this uh, Craig fence, which uh, is a really nice fence. Um, it wasn't expensive and uh, it was fairly easy to install. Now, uh, there's probably two issues that I have with this all. The first issue being that the miter slot is not your typical size. It's some proprietary size miter slot which means I can't use any off-the-shelf miter slide accessories like feather boards and miter gauges and all that stuff because it's a little bit smaller. So that right there is primarily the main reason I'm going to get rid of this bandsaw. Um, the second issue is the table is cupped a little bit. It's not that big of a deal on a bandsaw, but it is cupped. Um, so I'm going to be upgrading the saw probably sometime later this year. This back corner is where I keep all of my clamps. It's close to the assembly table, so it's easy to access. On the right, I have eight Jet branded parallel clamps. These are the 24 inch. And on the left, I have the uh, Bessie parallel clamps. I've got four of the 24s, three of the 39, and two of the 60 inch clamps, I believe. And on this back corner, this is where I keep all of my F clamps. Starting at the top, I've got the, uh, these Bessie heavy duty clamps. And I really like these because of the, uh, the throat capacity. And they're, uh, they're pretty heavy duty. I use these probably more than any other F-clamp. And I've got the little bitty 4-inch F-clamps as well. And then down here on the bottom, a majority of my F-clamps are the, the, the F-clamps that I picked up from Harbor Freight. For real light use, they're, uh, they're pretty good. But for anything where you need to clamp down on it, I do not use these because they flex extremely bad. And I've also got four of these Bessie Uniclamps. These are the, the light duty parallel clamps as well. Uh, that I use these quite often as well. These are the 24-inch Bessie Uni clamps. And finally here on the bottom, this is where I keep all of my Irwin quick clamps. Uh, just I stack them up on this 2x4 that I use to mount my dust collection pipe. So this is my router table and it's a 24x32 style table and it's really similar to the Incra uh, router tables. And the fence that I have on it is, uh, is actually an Incra knockoff and it was sold by a brand called Pinnacle. Uh, and I don't believe they're selling these anymore. I believe they stopped probably right when I bought this router table. But I picked this up as a demo unit from Woodcraft probably four or five years ago. And I recently upgraded to uh, the Incra uh, router lift. And let me tell you, that was a game changer. It is so much nicer being able to change the bits and all that stuff from the top side of the table instead of having to open it up and adjust the router from below. Uh, it just makes things a whole lot easier. Um, and speaking of the router, I have a Bosch 1617 uh, VS, I believe, router underneath. It's a two and a quarter. It's not really powerful, um, but I don't run really large bits. I primarily run roundovers, chamfers, or straight bits. So two and a quarter is uh, it's good enough for what I need. To the left of the router table, I have my Porter Cable drill press. And this was uh, another Lowe's purchase, actually. Um, for the price, this thing is really hard to beat. Uh, you know, it's got a powerful motor, it's got a light, it's got a laser, um, and 
it's accurate. I mean, it's uh, the chuck is accurate. There's no slop. Um, it's a fantastic uh, drill press for the price. Uh, now, one downside of this is my base was a little warped, so it moves around a little bit inside of the mobile base, but I can shim that, um, and it's not a big deal. Now, with this, the bandsaw, pretty much every tool in here except the, uh, the ink or router table and my table saw is on a mobile base because I'm always moving stuff around. Um, and especially, I had them on mobile bases for when I parked in the garage. So having a mobile base on your tools is extremely handy. So moving on, we're on the right side wall uh, if you're facing the front of the garage. And this is where I keep my mobile miter station um, that also houses a few other tools. But starting here, this is the Hitachi C12RSH. This is the 12 inch slider that you can pick up at Lowe's. If you haven't figured out that common theme, um, I purchase a lot of tools at Lowe's. <laughs> But this is, a, uh, this is a fantastic saw. I've not had any issues out of it um, since, I, since I picked this up. And this is probably my second woodworking tool purchase outside of a very cheap skill table saw. Um, I picked this up in order to cut 12 and a half inch wide uh, pine wood, actually. Um, but, you know, this has been a fantastic saw. Um, I use it mainly for breaking down rough stock. I don't use it for the fine cuts or any, any miters or anything like that. I typically use the table saw uh, with a crosscut sled for those type of cuts. But this, uh, the dust collection on this saw is, is decent. Uh, I guess it's, as with any miter saw, it's okay. It doesn't, it doesn't capture all the dust. Um, but I do have a shop vac connected directly to the port. And as you can see below, this is where the shop vac sits. Um, I do want to get one of those little IVAC uh, ports so that when you turn the saw on, it will turn the shop vac on because right now I have to reach under there and turn it on and off. It's not that big of a deal, but it'd be nice to have. Now, uh, one cool thing about this is since it's mobile, if I'm cutting really long lumber to the right of the blade, I can just pull this whole station out and then slide it down and cut however long lumber I need, 10 foot, 15 foot, whatever, or open the door and it's cut it as long as I want. So moving on to the left, this is the Wood River Mortiser, and I do not use it. Um, and I've been trying to get rid of it, but no one locally will take it. Um, I've had more parts break on this machine than I've cut mortises with it. The little gears on the inside, the teeth will break off. Uh, the little mechanism right here that the handle attaches to, the teeth are broken off of that. Uh, and I sharpen my chisels, my mortis mortising chisels, all the time. So it's not a case of dull chisels, I just, it's just not very high quality metal or whatever that's on the inside. To the left of the mortar, sir, we have a central machinery 12 inch disc sander. Uh, for the price, it's a really good uh, disc sander. The only issue that I have is the table. It is very flexible um, and it pretty much doesn't stay 90 to the disc, um, but it's one of those things that you get what you pay for with this. Uh, I mainly use this to uh, to hog away material on outside curves and whatnot. Um, but, I mean, it does a pretty good job. The dust collection is pretty good, uh, and it works out okay. Uh, as you can see, I probably need to change this disc. And to the left of that is the Central Machinery Oscillating Spindle Sander. And this is a fantastic tool for the price. The dust collection is great. Uh, the, the bed is, is flat and 90 to the, uh, to the spindle. Um, I've not had a single issue out of this. Um, it's just a really, really nice tool, and I use this all the time because I put curves in pretty much every one of my projects. So moving up the left side of this wall here, I'm now at the lathe station. And if you remember last video, I mentioned that I wanted to get the lathe off of the cabinets they were on before because it was too high, and it was a lot of wasted space because the cabinets are pretty deep. Uh, unfortunately, I had some termites, and that helped move that process along, so I ripped those two cabinets out and I built a mobile station for the lathe so that way I can pull it out from the wall, move it to the back of the shop where the garage door is, open it up, do some turning. To, that way I can uh, keep the, all of the mess on that side of the shop. Uh, I do have a build video on how to build this lathe stand, so I will link to that below, as well as there's a card here in the video. Uh, this is the Jet 1221 VS with the bed extension. And I don't turn a whole lot. I mainly do spindle work. Um, so this lathe is perfect for that. And maybe some smaller bowls that I, that I did turn last year as well. But it's a, it's a great lathe, zero issues, and it does everything that I need. Above the lathe, I have three of these cabinets that I use for sandpaper, finishing, and glue storage. And above the cabinets is where I keep my veneer. 
So in this left cabinet, I have my sandpaper, and I do have a video showing how I made this sandpaper cabinet. It's an extremely old video of mine, so be warned. Um, but, you know, this works out pretty well. I have outgrown uh, the number of slots available for the sanding discs because I now have 150 uh, and 60 grit and all that stuff. So I do need to come up with a different solution for my sanding discs. But for the, uh, the sheet goods over here, it, it works out pretty good. This middle cabinet is where I keep all of my finishing supplies, um, all of my stains, dyes, shellacs, varnishes, all that stuff. Well, almost all of that goes in this cabinet here. And on the right side, the final cabinet that's above the lathe, I have the rest of my varnishes uh, and lacquers on the bottom. Uh, some of my glues on the left side, epoxies, two-part epoxies. Uh, my little acid brushes that I get from Harbor Freight because they're nice and cheap. And at the top, just a few uh, various little jigs for aligning your table saw. And, and of course, you've got to have your tongue depressors for mixing up your varnishes and, and stuff. And up here, I keep all of my veneer glue, uh, the heat lock, the cold press glue, and the tight bond cold press glue, as well as my regular tight bond wood glue up there. And on the right, I just got my Osmo uh, Pollux and my Sam Malou finish and jigsaw. So now in the middle of the shop, we have the table saw. This is a saw stop PCS three horsepower table saw. It's got the 36 inch cutting capacity. Um, it's a great saw. I've only triggered the, uh, the, the break on it one time, and that was when I, uh, I think I was cutting a piece of wood that had a, an aluminum T-track, and it cut into the T-track and instantly stopped. Um, it was my fault. It messed up the blade and the break, so it was an expensive mistake uh, that you, you definitely don't want to repeat. Uh, but like I was saying, this is a great saw. The dust collection in the cabinet is pretty good. The dust collection over the blade is, is great uh, once you have adequate suction from your uh, dust collection. Um, but no complaints with the saw whatsoever. Uh, it works exactly as, uh, as advertised. So now behind the table saw we have the outfeed slash assembly table. I do have a build video showing how to make this. Um, it is a five foot by four foot assembly table. It's dead flat um, and it's just fantastic. I love having it. It gives me so much room for glue ups and, and, and uh, especially for larger projects. Now it does have two doors on this side and then six drawers on the left side to allow me to store some stuff. Uh, so let me go ahead and pull you in and show you what I keep in those. The assembly table has two doors on this side on the front of it for uh, two really deep storage compartments. I keep my sander, some pin nailers, my track saw, um, brad nailers, uh, all kinds of miscellaneous screws, my veneer bag, my vacuum pump, trash bag for the trash can, and again, some more miscellaneous screws. The left side of the assembly table has eight drawers, and the top drawer is currently empty. And the next, I have all of my router bits um, and throat plates for the router table, but I currently store all of my router bits in one of these little I guess foam blocks that has the quarter inch and half inch holes drilled for the shank of the router bit. But this allows me to keep everything really organized and in one place. Next, I just got some miscellaneous junk. And on the bottom, I've got my glue gun and a bunch of tape. On the left, four drawers. I've got a bunch of router accessories, uh, edge guides and dust collection pieces. Next drawer, I've got all of my sharpening supplies, uh, diamond paste, water stones, diamond plates, rubbing compound, my strop, my jointer blade, uh, I guess, honing guide. In the next drawer, I have a bunch, of, a bunch of hardware in these containers. And of course, you gotta have your Katz Moses dovetail guides. These things are awesome. And in the bottom, I've got all of my Craig jigs. So that wraps up part one of the shop tour. If you're interested, I also recorded a Q&A session where I had some folks over on Instagram ask me a few questions about my shop. So be on the lookout for that video. It should drop in about a day or two. I appreciate you guys watching this. And if you like the video, hit the thumbs up. And if you're not already, please subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you in the next build video.